Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. Now that we're into the final week of the NFL's regular season, let's forget about how we've been picking them lately. Please, if you don't mind. Josh, you're 13 and 23, and I have worked my way up to 20 <laughs> and 16. Well, let's look back at the long-range picks uh, Super Bowl we made before the season started and see how we made out. Well, Who'd you pick, then? Let's see. In the AFC, I believe I went with the, uh, the Pride and Poise boys from the Oakland Raider yeah, team. That certainly turned out to be a good choice. Yeah, pretty good guess, wasn't it? How about you in the AFC, Pat? I think I picked uh, the team that I thought had the best 40-man roster in the league, Kansas City. They still I, might have. They might have. Something's wrong, though. Who'd you have in the NFC? Eagles, huh? Yeah, I went with a green and white. Actually, <laughs> uh, I made a mistake and went with the Washington Redskins. It turned out to be a pretty good pick. Pretty good picker. Who'd I you guess. have in the NFC? I think I picked uh, another team based on what I thought was a lot of depth, Dallas. You're not going to count them out yet, are you? I guess we can. Anyway, we've got three of our four preseason picks did make it to the playoffs at least. And don't forget, at the end of this show, we'll have our up-to-the-day predictions on this week's games, as well as our selection as best of the week. Last Sunday, the Los Angeles Rams came into St. Louis for a very important game, and they came out with a very important loss. With a 2-9-1 record, the guys from the Golden Archway, the Cardinals, entered last Sunday's game thinking Christmas couldn't come too soon. And against Tommy Prothrow's Rams, it came early. The Rams turned a critical game into a Christmas party and played Santa showering the Cardinals with gifts from near and far. Four times in the first half alone, Los Angeles turned over the ball to St. Louis, and the Cardinals graciously accepted. One score was set up on an interception by number 20, Miller Farr. Another was achieved directly on Norm Thompson's touchdown run with a recovered Rams fumble. The Cardinals built a 17 to nothing halftime lead on these turnovers and a 98 yard run catch and run from Jim Hart to Bobby Moore, whose motor finally stopped working on the one. victory in this game would have put them in good position to take the NFC West and they clawed back in the second half. The running and receiving of the Ram runners number 45 Jim Bertelson and number 34 Les Josephson rallied the Rams to within three going into the last quarter. But Jim Hart and Walker Gillette teamed on a scoring pass and the Rams were never able to rebound. Actually, the St. Louis Cardinals defense won the game for them. Three times the Rams had a fourth and goal from inside the three. The Rams went for it and failed each time. Final score, St. Louis 24, Los Angeles Rams 14. Elsewhere in the NFC West, last week in San Francisco, the Atlanta Falcons had come down to the biggest game in their history. In view of that, Pat, I'd say they picked a real bad day to go scoreless. For Coach Dick Nolan, a loss to the Falcons meant goodbye playoffs. 
His greatest asset was Steve Spurrier, who had led the 49ers through some tough times following John Brody's injury. For Coach Norm Van Brocklin and his Falcons, it was the most important game in their history. The first they'd ever played with a division title at stake. Right from the outset, the Falcons made it obvious that on this day, they were playing for keeps. But despite their Rockham defense, they were forced to watch nervously as the 49ers on two Bruce Gossett field goals opened a 6-0 halftime lead. In the second half, the Vic Washington Express bucked and bruised the 49ers to within easy scoring range. And twice, Ken Willard, number 40, plowed in for one-yard touchdowns to give San Francisco a 20-0 lead. The Falcons tried valiantly to come back, but big gainers such as this one were nullified by miscues. Although Atlanta recovered this one, there were three other drive killers that they lost. And in the end, the deciding factor was the 49ers' stormy defense that charged and sacked and recovered and inspired their way to victory. When it was a matter of inches, the 49er defense got those inches and the Falcons came up empty. The final score was San Francisco 20, Atlanta nothing. The 49er defense had paid the price, and for men like 14-year veteran Charlie Kruger, who is nearing the end of his road in the NFL, the price was a bargain, even if it meant a temporarily swollen eye. Last week, the Bears and the Eagles got together in Philadelphia, where the Eagles finished their home season without a win. If we had the time, I'd give all of you Philadelphia fans a long moment of silence. Eagles fans are already looking ahead to next year, and who can blame them? Because the way quarterback Bobby Douglas, number 10, of the Bears toyed with them, any hope for a home victory this year was long gone. The Eagles did muster some offense as John Reeves, number six, hit Kent Kramer, number 87, for a score. And they also mustered some defense, which accounted for another two points. But Bobby Douglas and the Bears proved too much. On his only completion of the day, Douglas hit number 82, Earl Thomas, and he acted like he had scored when all he really did was set up a one-yard score by Roger Lawson, which put the Bears ahead for good. So the Eagles yanked Reeves and put in a quarterback, Pete Lisk by name, with a little more firepower. So the Eagles yanked Lisk and put in a quarterback, Rick Arrington by name, with a little more firepower. Arrington's clunker turned into a head thunker and left at least one bear wondering how to defense the famous eagle running prayer pass. But the Chicago defense caught on quickly as Charlie Ford, number 32, intercepted, and then lateral to Craig Clemens, number 25, who put on quite a show.
Bobby Douglas put on a show of his own as he blasted 32 yards for the final Chicago touchdown. And only one Philadelphia partisan even approached Douglas' game-breaking ability. Unfortunately, the Philadelphia police tackled better than the Philadelphia Eagles. And the lone Eagle was himself nullified and was persuaded to leave the game early. Unperturbed by a missed snap on the extra point, Bobby Douglas recovered and threw to Dick Butkus for the singleton. And the 21-12 Chicago victory got the usual response from the loss-weary Philadelphia fans. Well, I guess it's safe now. It's over. Last Sunday down in New Orleans, the Saints and the New England Patriots met for the first time in championship play. But there wasn't much championship play involved in their meeting. Only the dubious reward of a poorer position in the draft was at stake for the winner. Archie Manning, number eight, and Jim Plunkett, number 16, have not yielded many victories for the New Orleans Saints or the New England Patriots. But their promise has burned through many disastrous moments in their longest season. And for both teams, the future remains an honest hope. Early in the game, number eight showed why 20 out of 26 NFL teams have said they would trade their starting quarterback for Archie Manning. This play was nullified by an offside penalty, and for the Saints, the promise remained unfulfilled. Jim Plunkett also showed what he could do with a little help from his friends. And this 31-yarder to Reggie Rucker put the Patriots ahead 7-3 in the second quarter. When number 62, Halver Hagen, forced this fumble, and number 63, Rick Cash, recovered it, the Patriots were in field position to gain another score. On the next play, Jim Plunkett cashed in on Cash's recovery, hitting Reggie Rucker again streaking to the end zone, and the Patriots were living in the future, leading 14-3. Beginning the second half, Archie drove the Saints back, fighting rookie Bill Butler for a 21-yard gain. Butler's fumble was recovered by number 77, Carl Johnson, the rookie from Nebraska, and the Saints' drive was intact. Three plays later, Manning bombed 26 yards to Danny Abramowitz in stride in the end zone, completing an 80-yard drive in 10 plays. But with the score 17 to 10 favoring New England, the Patriot defense took root and the Saints' hopes withered. Number 29, Honor Jackson, collected this deflected pass as the New England defense held on to decide the Promises Promises Bowl in New Orleans. Final score 17 to 10, New England.
Last week, the Baltimore Colts traveled to Kansas City for a game which wasn't quite as important as the experts thought it would be when the schedule was first published. The fantastic new scoreboard in fantastic new Arrowhead Stadium shows highlights of previous Kansas City games. There haven't been as many highlights in Arrowhead as there were in old Municipal Stadium. The last week brought Baltimore, a team which had won three in a row, and as Colt coach John Sandusky said, quote, they just ran the ball down our throats. Number 38, Wendell Hayes, left Colt strewn all over the field as he rushed 19 times and gained 104 hard-earned yards on the ground and 55 more through the air. Lynn Dawson hit on 15 of 21 passes for two touchdowns, one of them to Wendell Hayes. Dawson's second touchdown went to another old Kansas City favorite, and now apparently healthy, Otis Taylor. Another who returned from the injured to score against Baltimore was number 14, Ed Podolak. After a 10-10 halftime tie, the Chiefs monopolized the remainder of the game. As in the old days at Municipal Stadium, the offense controlled the ball with long scoring drives, while the defense manhandled the opposition's backfield. For Kansas City fans, it was a glimpse of better days gone by. The Chiefs cooled the Colts 24-10. Elsewhere in the AFC West, like the Chiefs, neither the Denver Broncos nor the San Diego Chargers are in the race anymore, Tom. That's right, Pat. And the way the weather was in Denver last Sunday, I would imagine neither team even felt like showing up. With nothing at stake but fear of the cold, the Chargers met the Broncos in sub-zero Denver weather. This was no place for the sunshine San Diegan beachcombers, and some even decided to leave early. Actually, the weather would affect both teams' ability to possess the ball, and the Rocky Mountain boys had their troubles, too. But no one was affected like number 21, John Hadel. Hadel suffered through one of the most frustrating days of his long career, his cannon misfiring more than once. The man on the receiving end of both of Hadel's duds was Lyle Alzado, leader of the Bronco defense, and a constant thorn in Hadel's side last Sunday. When Hadel wasn't firing duds, his receivers were stone cold too. Even the ghost, Gary Garrison, felt the numbing chill in his claws. This was a day Hadel and his receivers would love to forget. When Hadel wasn't firing duds and when his receivers weren't dropping them, Hadel was being dropped himself under the fury of the Bronco rush. Charger fortunes read like the house that Jack built. When Hadel wasn't firing duds, when his receivers weren't dropping them, when he wasn't being dropped, plays like this one to Pettis Norman, number 88, were nullified due to penalties. Hadel did manage to find the ghost 10 times, once for a touchdown, but it came late and was their only touchdown. Between this score and the opening whistle, the Broncos laid it on San Diego. 
Number 25, Haven Moses, and number 12, quarterback Charlie Johnson, took their hands out of their pockets long enough to connect on two scoring passes. It was amazing that the Broncos were able to roll it up in the sub-zero weather. Charlie Greer skittered and skated his way down the sidelines on a 65-yard punt return, highlighting a lopsided Bronco victory. But it will be a long winter in both towns as neither team has fulfilled its preseason expectations. Broncos 34, Chargers 13. Even though they lost to the Pittsburgh Steelers last week, it was almost a moral victory for the Houston Oilers, Tom. That's right, Pat, because the Oilers are notoriously weak against the run. I think everyone expected Franco Harris to beat Jim Brown's record of six consecutive 100-yard rushing games. But for once in the Astrodome, something unexpected happened. Basking in the Astrodome's glow, Franco Harris was ready to embark on history. But against the lowly Oilers, Jim Brown's record remained safe for another year, even though Harris did gain his 1,000th yard. The game featured rock-tough defense as both teams lost their quarterbacks. The Oilers' Dan Pastorini suffered a leg injury while Terry Bradshaw limped off in pain with two dislocated fingers. With backup Terry Hanratty on the reserve list, the Steelers used rookie Joe Gilliam, who absorbed his share of bruises. Houston hit hard, but the Steelers hit even harder. Rising above the team effort was number 75, Mean Joe Green. Often burrowing in on his hands and knees, Green completely disrupted the Oiler attack and sacked their quarterbacks on four occasions. Mean Joe, the ball, and the running back met in simultaneous rendezvous. And he dealt out a season's worth of woe to the Oilers in a single game. By game's end, Joe Green's heroics and three Roy Jarella field goals combined to beat Houston 9-3 as Pittsburgh assured itself a spot in the AFC playoffs. Elsewhere in the AFC Central last week, Pat, those two Ohio teams went at it in the sixth renewal of the rivalry everybody knew would be one of the hottest in the game. Certainly has been that, Tom. For the fifth time in six games, the two teams that Paul Brown built were separated by four points or less. This is the face of the future for the Cleveland Browns. Mike Phipps is only 24 years old, but he's now listed with such names as Otto Graham, Milt Plum, Frank Ryan, and Bill Nelson. They are all quarterbacks who have led the Browns into postseason play. And last week, Cincinnati's Mike Reed and company made sure Phipps earned the right to be in the playoffs. After a scoreless first quarter, Mike Phipps just managed to get off a pass to Frank Pitts. Five Bengals converged and knocked each other off, and the Phipps-Pitts partnership had a 50-yard touchdown spectacular. Mike Phipps was injured on the touchdown play, so the old firm of Nelson, Kelly, and Hickerson, with a combined 34 years of experience, built the Cleveland lead to 14 to nothing. Twenty-three-year-old Ken Anderson had two touchdowns called back in the previous game against the Giants. Against the Browns, Anderson had two more rubbed out, but this time they hurt more. Despite losing this scoring play, Chip Myers caught eight passes and was assured a place among the league's top receivers for the season. Like Mike Phipps, Ken Anderson was shaken up while passing. And Virgil Carter entered and ran Cincinnati back into the game.
Virgil Carter led the Bengals to 17 straight points. And when Essex Johnson swept left early in the third quarter, Cincinnati led for the first time 17-14. The Cincinnati faithful could smell the playoffs, but their joy lasted only until the next series when a fumble punt led to another Cleveland touchdown. In fact, four of Cleveland's five scores were set up by Cincinnati mistakes. This time, Fair Hooker did the honors in the end zone. After another Virgil Carter-led touchdown drive and two Don Cockcroft field goals, Cleveland led 27-24 with four minutes to play. Then Virgil Carter started one last drive, this time for the winning touchdown. With 55 seconds left, Carter led the Bengals to the Cleveland seven yard line, first and goal to go. A run failed and on second down, Carter faked the run, rolled to his right and threw for Chip Myers in the end zone. Number 52, linebacker Billy Andrews had saved the game and possibly the entire season for the Browns. Both teams had entered the game as contenders for the playoffs, and suddenly, with just 40 seconds left to play in the game, the Bengals had been eliminated. The Browns would go on to postseason play, as they had so many times before in their long and illustrious history. Both Calvin Hill and Walt Garrison gained over 100 yards last week as the Dallas Cowboys stuck it to the Washington Redskins in a revenge match at Texas Stadium. The festive atmosphere at Texas Stadium belied the fact that the Dallas Cowboys needed a victory over the NFC Eastern champion Redskins to ensure their spot as the wild card team in the playoffs. George Allen was resting Larry Brown for the playoffs, so right from the start, the doomsday defense chewed up redskin runners. Whenever number 74 Bob Lilly occupied two blockers, number 54 Chuck Howley burned into Billy Kilmer on blitzes. On offense, Dallas relied on Calvin Hill, who became the first Cowboy runner ever to rush for 1,000 yards in a season. Behind Blaine Nye's picture block on number 66, Myron Pottius, Hill turned the corner for an easy score. The Cowboys built a 14-0 lead when Craig Morton evaded the fierce redskin rush and lobbed a touchdown to the wide open Calvin Hill. Hill's touchdown is worth reviewing because on that play, he was covered by number 32, Jack Pardee. Seeing Morton rushed, Hill sped to an open area and his persistence was rewarded by six points. Hill's running mate, Walt Garrison, number 32, also gained over 100 yards. And this determined 41-yard burst was the longest of his distinguished career. On a quick opener, Garrison bolted 25 yards to a touchdown. That gave Dallas a quick 21-0 lead. Dallas built a 28-3 halftime bulge when Morton sent his line to the left and he rolled right. The sucker play completely fooled the befuddled Redskins and Morton scored easily. In the second half, George Allen rekindled Redskin pride, and the Over the Hill gang responded like the team that has tasted defeat but only one time this year. Washington rolled on Billy Kilmer's right arm, and Jerry Smith's ability to beat Dallas short and deep coverage.
Washington came to Dallas with number 28, Herbert Mulkey, a rookie who runs like Larry Brown. Billy Kilmer threw for three second half touchdowns. The first one went to Charlie Taylor, who barely kept both feet in bounds. Gilmer's second touchdown resulted from a throw and go to Roy Jefferson, the Skins' other wide receiver. When Charlie Haraway picked off number 55 linebacker Leroy Jordan, Kilmer got his hat trick with a balloon to Charlie Taylor. The Redskins outscored Dallas 21 to six in the last two periods but in the end, the Cowboys held on to win 34-24 and earned a spot in the NFC playoffs. You've heard us say it before, but last week in Buffalo, there really was someone painting bold strokes on a 100-yard canvas. These, then, are the artists painting bold strokes on a 100-yard canvas made of slop. These, then in blue, are the Buffalo Bills, who often play the way their field looks. The Lions recovered the Dennis Shaw fumble, and Greg Landry hit a streaking Earl McCullough to give Detroit a 7-0 lead in a game they had to win to stay alive for a playoff spot. But the Bills lashed back, and Dennis Shaw to number 40, J.D. Hill, tied it at seven all. A tie could only hurt the Lions, whereas nothing could hurt the Bills. The way Shaw had the Bills going, one would have thought that they were the team with a playoff shot. In the second quarter, the Bills went ahead on a fantastic leaping catch by number 81, Bob Chandler. But again, a Buffalo miscue led directly to a Detroit Lion tally. On the play after the muff punt, Greg Landry tied the game again on a pass to Nick Eddy, number 40, who was making his first appearance in the last 29 Lion games. Once more, Dennis Shaw led the Bills goalward. He went to Bob Chandler again on this one. Shaw then hit tight end Jan White, number 80, to put the Bills up 21 to 14. With time fading, Greg Landry launched a rocket to Ron Jesse, number 89. But the best the Lions could muster was a 21-all tie, and in this case, instead of kissing their sister, they kissed the playoffs goodbye. Elsewhere in the NFC Central last week, Green Bay and Minnesota met in that Bloomington Ice Palace. That's what you call a red-hot Cold War. Last year was Dan Devine's first as head coach of the Green Bay Packers. His team finished 4-8-2. and two. Last Sunday, he was preparing to deprive the Minnesota Vikings of the NFC Central Division title for the first time in five years. Both the Packers and the Vikings' hopes live on defense. But a little too much defense got the pack in trouble early. In an interference call against number 48, Ken Ellis gave the Vikings life at the Green Bay 22. Five plays later, Fran Tarkenton handed to number 83, Stu Voigt, on an inside end around, and the Vikings led 7-0. Number 39, Jimmy Hill's protestations went unsatisfied. 
But the Packers reestablished momentum with a 15 play sequence in the last three minutes of the half. Number 84, Carol Dale received this pass as the pack moved with blended running and passing. Number 42, John Brockington burst to the Viking three, but a penalty one play later put the ball on Minnesota's 20. With 16 seconds remaining, Scott Hunter's pass intended for Carroll Dale was intercepted by Paul Kraus as the Vikings held on to win the first half 7 to nothing. But beginning the third period, MacArthur Lane cut back 37 yards across a half-frozen chewy gridiron to set up a 29-yard Chester Marcole field goal. But it was the defense that brought the Packers to life. When Bill Brown fumbled after receiving a Fran Tarkenton pass, number 53, Fred Carr, claimed the gift. And six plays later, Scott Hunter snuck one yard for Green Bay's first touchdown. the next series, Tarkenton's perfect pass was juggled by John Gilliam and picked off by number 28, Willie Buchanan. Four plays later, number 36, MacArthur Lane drove three yards over Carl Eller and Green Bay led 17-7. On the next series, Green Bay's candidate for defensive rookie of the year, Willie Buchanan, again intercepted. And two fourth quarter field goals by Chester Marco gave the Packers a 23-7 victory. Green Bay had many heroes this Sunday, but a large share of the victory belonged to John Brockington and number 36, MacArthur Lane. Each shredded the Purple Gang for more than 100 yards while accounting for 214 yards of ball control rushing offense. It was the first taste of glory for the pack since 1967. And with seven rookies among 18 new faces, this victory to clinch a Central Division title represents a monumental rebuilding job in just two years under Dan Devine. And for this new team, there is a fine old tradition and an honored description. The Packers are tough. Last week in Yankee Stadium, Don Shula's Miami Dolphins won their 13th straight game of the year. And there's only one way you can do better than that. With Bob Greasy back in uniform, the Miami Dolphins went after Lucky 13 in New York, hoping they wouldn't need him. But victory number 13 didn't start out too well as Norm Sneed's pass to Don Herman put the Giants on the Miami 1 from where Ron Johnson took it in. The extra point was blocked, and New York led 6-0. The wind feet of Mercury Morris quickly put things in their proper perspective. Sneed to number 38, tight end Bob Tucker. A rugged performer all season put the Giants in close, but they fumbled on the next play to kill the drive.
The game then became a punch it out infantry battle with number 21 Jim Kick leading the Dolphins. The Giants countered with number 29, Vince Clements, who has come into his own in the latter part of the season. Number 30, Ron Johnson, the Giants' 1,000-yard rusher, crashed in to give New York the lead. But Earl Marl to Paul Warfield proved a deadly poison, and the Giants could find no antidote. Combined with three Garrow Yeprimian field goals, the Marl to Warfield combo gave the Dolphins enough point power for a 23 13 victory. thing about it was that Bob Greasy didn't even have to get his cleats muddy. So we say almost every week, Pat, those amazing dolphins could have been our choice as best of the week almost any week so far. Seems like we have said that a lot, haven't we, Tom? Sure have. But this week, though, there were two other performances which I believe were the best. One was the overall team performance of Dan Devine's Green Bay Packers. That young Packer defense really shut down the Vikings in the second half and the Green Bay ground game on offense with Brockington and Lane just really crunched right through them, didn't they? A worthy choice for best of the week, the NFC Central champion, Green Bay Packers. And Tom, an equally worthy choice, I think, would be the performance of the front four of the Pittsburgh Steelers, particularly number 75 defensive tackle, Mean Joe Green. Of course, they're more than just one great player like Mean Joe Green is. Uh, L.C. Greenwood, the defensive end out of Arkansas AM&N. Defensive end Dwight White. In his second year out of East Texas State has been outstanding, too. And the fellow that's been with them before the Steelers made this great comeback, Ben McGee, in his ninth year out of Jackson State. He's been great. But the key to the whole thing, and I think they'd all admit that, would be defensive tackle Joe Green, who has been uh, to the Pro Bowl all three of his years so far, and certainly he deserves to go back again. A 270-pounder, by the way, that's very quiet and meek off the field, but boy, on Sunday afternoon, he's something else. He really is. But, you know, he even <laughs> resents being called mean. He doesn't like that name, and he doesn't know where it started, either. So our best of the week, that great front four, the defensive four for the Pittsburgh Steelers. You know, when you stop and think about it, the front four have been very, very key performers all year, but it's a, it's a good defense overall. They've done, they strengthened themselves considerably in the secondary. Three yeah. linebackers are good, too. Yeah, they went to the draft to get that secondary right. straightened out. Right. How about our picks now? Oh, boy. Kansas City, Atlanta, you have a, I guess what you could call a comfortable margin over me now. Kansas City, Atlanta, what do you think? I think uh, the Van Brocklin still might have the Falcons ready for one big game. They've been sort of escalating yeah, up and down, but yeah. I think they may go on to beat Kansas City. Well, Kansas City, uh, as you recall, I picked at the beginning of the year. I think they still got a good squad. How about Detroit, Los Angeles? Uh, I'm going to be out there. I'm going to go with the Detroit Lions. I've picked them, I think, for about the last five straight years, but I think the Lions still think they have a mathematical chance. Of course, well, the same can be said for the Rams. We'll take a look uh, next week, and we'll be back to show you what happens. I'm Pat Summerall. And I'm Tom Brookshire, and we'll see you next week.